Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Digital Health Showcase on Virtual Care. Uh, I'm Randy Pallotta, uh, very happy to be up here uh, with our four presenters. This is more of a panel session. I do have uh, some questions to guide the discussion, uh, but I will go ahead and we'll start off. We have Tariq, Alexander, Einer, and Daniel, and we'll kind of get started, maybe just left to right. Uh, if you gentlemen would introduce yourselves and introduce your businesses, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. Uh, I'm Dan, CEO and co-founder of Lura Health. We're really proud to be a part of the InterSystems ecosystem. What we do is we make a wearable health monitor that tracks health non-invasively via saliva instead of blood. So what that looks like is instead of you know, an arm-based continuous glucose monitor or implant or some blood uh, monitoring system, we made a tiny chip that fits in the mouth integrated into existing dental products that can track health via saliva in your mouth rather than the blood in your veins. Um, we are thrilled to be here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Einar. I am a CEO and founder of Priya Care. Uh, we are the first startup where InterSystem invested from the new venture arm. And uh, we're building operating system for health at home. And uh, our vision is unlock health at home for millions of patients. How we do that, we connect uh, our platform to the EMR and streamline all services like a telehealth, RPM, RTM, and all new Medicare codes into the one simple interface where our beloved ones and the grandparents and uh, grand uh, and mothers and dads they could uh, be always connected with uh, the healthcare providers, just simple as watching TV. Hello, my name is. Alexander Strakowski, I'm the CEO and founder of iPlanner. We correct with posture data and AI the posture in just three minutes a day. How we do it, we scan posture asymmetries, disbalances, and propose a personalized posture adapted workout to the patients, and we connect patients to the doctors. Doctors save time, patients or and any other user can get benefits and is every time linked by home screening with his doctor and we're using InterSystems technology to make all this possible just in seconds. Hello, my name is Tarek Chaudhry. Uh, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Maro. I'm a practicing pediatrician and our team is working to solve the problems with the pediatric mental health crisis. We've created, we're basically creating a digital SaaS platform that will act as a marketplace that will help connect schools, uh, healthcare systems, and families to better communicate, educate, and then refer and coordinate care services around pediatric mental health. Uh, so we are, and we are part of uh, InterSystems early uh, kind of a startup group and have had some grant funding for POC funding and are really excited to be here. All right, terrific. Uh, so yeah, we'll go ahead and, and dive right in. I'll probably call on each of you uh, to start uh, each sort of uh, response, and we'll kind of work left to right. Uh, but maybe, Daniel, if we could start with you. Uh, with interoperability being a significant concern in the healthcare industry, uh, of course, data fragmentation and siloed systems might impede patient care, hinder medical research, increase administrative burdens. How do you see and deal with interoperability, and how is InterSystems uh, playing a role in helping you meet those objectives? It's a it's the million dollar question for all these companies. Um, data becomes most valuable when it's accessible across industries, when it's accessible by all players in the patient journey, uh, clinicians, patients, care providers, and when it really touches all areas of the patient care journey. So our product is unique in the sense that we monitor systemic health conditions, so uh, chronic diseases like you know, diabetes, chronic kidney, heart disease, these are our targets, uh, medication markers, so really systemic diseases, but our product is implemented as a dental device. So you, know, you get it at the dentist or get it through dental pathways, and dental is an interesting industry where it's completely siloed for the most part from the rest of medical, which a lot of people in dentistry are very frustrated about. You have practice management systems instead of EMR systems that only the dentists see, 
they treat dental like a totally different part of, of the body and there's not a lot of overlap today between uh, the medical community. People are trying to change that. I mean, one notable chain for dentistry just adopted Epic. They were the first to do that, uh, to bridge medical versus dental. But in summary, we need to be able to touch all these systems. So not only the dental management record system for that area and that care provider, but also the electronic medical record systems for the primary care provider, for the specialist. And if we were gonna build out systems for all of these, we would essentially have to build out a new piece of software for each plugin, for each EMR. But with InterSystems, we can use one database that has superior interop capabilities to plug into all of them at once. So it saves a ton of time, a ton of cost, and is uh, ultimately the best way to get data across the care continuum. Thank you, Daniel. And Einer, how, would, how do you see interoperability? How are you meeting those challenges? For me, it's uh, uh, fundamental. Uh, and I, I just want to give an example. So how it works now and how it could work with the uh, interoperability uh, at scale. So the journey of patient now, uh, when he is discharged, he go to the discharge nurse, then she give him some documents. Then inside of these documents, there are some care plan. And don't forget, the patient have just six minutes in average in the States to talk with the doctor. And then he go to home, and now he need to follow all his prescriptions. Uh, he need to know when his follow-up visit, and uh, when is the annual wellness check, and uh, wh when he need to do the telehealth call, and uh, how to uh, give back the data from his device if it's a prescriber. So now it's uh, extremely fragmented. And the, reason, and the, the outcomes of that, it's uh, adherence rate for the care plans and for the drugs is very low, and uh, specifically Medicare population. And uh, that's how we see the problem of adherence rate just for the drugs, it's a $300 billion problem. And for the care plan overall, it's a $600 billion. So it's, a, it's a huge, and, uh, and the healthcare is not just in the hospital. It's, uh, people stay majority of the time in the home. So that's how InterSystem help us uh, to connect to the EMR, speak in one language, make it very quick, and be in the cloud, uh, securely get the care plan model in the Epic, for example, convert using GPT-4 to summarize this data to the wellness plan of Priya, and now we know all care plans what is prescribed to this patient, all his drugs, and every time when he needs to do the follow-up, like a call or visit, he also could uh, do it through Priya. So this is absolutely new experience, and I think interoperability is like the beginning of the internet, that's what I feel, and it will totally change the whole environment of healthcare and I think the, one of the last uh, point is the patients now and patient in five, seven years, it will be totally different patients. This patient will ask the access of all of the healthcare data and they wanna be uh, manage their health by themselves and not only uh, follow the hospital uh, care plans, they wanna be the part of that to really partner with a healthcare provider. So that's why the, for us, interoperability is just like fundamental. It's like a being in the internet or to take getting Wi-Fi. It's a all. Excellent, I, and I agree with the analogy. And Alexander, how about yourself? How do you see interoperability? So most of the things was already said. Yeah. <laughs> but but <laughs> I think interop yeah. interoperability really depends also on the regulators uh, on each country and on each yeah, juristic, jurisdiction, and here I think that the most important thing, as the both said, that the data should be decentralized. So it shouldn't be like everyone collects some data points, but if you don't put them all in one place, the patient is not getting this benefit she, he should get. And here is one most important point also for us because we are like, we collect posture data. We see the posture development of each patient over weeks, months. We track every training he made or she made. And here we see that the value comes from 
connecting and combining data points together also from other suppliers. And the more data we combine together, the more predictions we can make, the more interlinked connections in medicine we can make. And this is the real value of interoperability and data. And yeah, inter-systems make it for us really easy to connect with our B2B partners. The APIs are much more understandable than with other partners before. Yep. <laughs> and it saves a lot of time, a lot of money. And in the end, in fact, if you say that you work with inter-systems, there are also much more trust from the B2B partners and that helps a lot. So actually, we are really happy also with the speed of generating our posture reports because that was a problem before. And yeah, yeah so inter systems really fast and safe. More I don't need. Excellent. Well, we'll take it. And Tarek, anything you'd add to that? Uh, Covered a lot no, of ground already, there. Yeah, yeah, they've already said everything. I'll say I love dentists. My in-laws are dentists, so no, you know. So, but I, I think one one story. I can just maybe kind of couch it in the clinical story. My last uh, hospital shift that I was on, um, I had to uh, help a poor family. A girl had taken a whole bottle of Tylenol, and had a massive uh, Tylenol overdose, and. Uh, she was obviously having suicide, had been admitted to the hospital multiple times, had been in the ER multiple times, and had been on a long mental health journey. Um, by the, you know, thankfully, she did not progress to liver, complete liver failure, which in, in anyone would require a liver transplant with a high risk of death. Um, you know, and, and I think about this girl with the work that we do every day at Morrow, uh, and what if we had found out that information uh, maybe when she was in her, nor her often normal environment, which is in the school systems. School systems right now in this country are doing some levels of, of health screening. There are school counselors, nurses, psychologists that are interacting with kids in some schools, and they have a sense of what's going on with kids. But there's this siloed, siloed scenario where healthcare and school systems aren't talking to one another. Now, healthcare systems are just as bad, you know. And we, we have, of course, we have, HERP, uh, we have HIPAA, that's kind of like you know preventing people from sharing and people aren't talking and that's what uh, that's what schools and hospitals are saying right now they can't share data with each other so we're trying to build on a platform where we actually make the parents or the family more of a data owner and yep. bring them into the relationship where they're consenting and there's transparency amongst all three groups that are in this little community the village that it takes to raise kids and they can share data. And then that, that parent or the guardian, or the person that's the caretaker, can help bridge the, the gap between the school and the health system that is that's helping, that's preventing us from sharing data. So our goal is that we learn about kids when they have more milder onset of symptoms, or that we get to them earlier so that we can refer them easily to within our healthcare system. And we have like kind of a, a TurboTax-like system built out to help speed care coordination referrals. But we want that health data, that you know, PHQ-9 or depression or anxiety data, ADHD data, or the eating disorder data, which is on our future roadmap, to be able to be sent to the healthcare providers that can care for them and shared openly so we can all have a discussion about how to coordinate care best for these kids. So it's really the same thing everything is saying. Um, and I think because we have such a crisis with mental health in this country and lives are at risk, and uh, you know, we're just excited to be able to do this. And InterSystem lets us easily port over the like healthcare flow sheet data into an EMR and then share things back uh, with schools and parents. So it's uh, you know, it's, so we're really really excited. Our work is early. We've done POC work so far. Um, I think we're the youngest startup here, um, but uh, we're really excited to, to have an opportunity to, to bridge the, the interoperability gap. Yeah, well, we're, we're excited too for sure. And certainly you all spoke you know, about interoperability and also how technology enables it. And maybe, uh, Tarek, I'll just stick with you for a follow-up. Was there anything non-technical when you're looking for a technology partner, anything other than the technology itself that maybe led you uh, to select InterSystems to partner with as opposed to another vendor? Well, I think the, the, you know, we, uh, we uh, met uh, for, with InterSystems at uh, TechCrunch uh, yep. uh, la this last year. And I think what I notice is this, this great openness with InterSystems to work with early stage companies. Yes. Um, and like just the feeling I've had here with, you know, people knowing what we're trying to do and we're just this little itty bitty, you know, uh, like hopefully closing our pre-seed round here like uh, this week. Um, you know, it's, it's really been, a, been amazing and the kind of investment and in looking toward the future of what can develop. I think that's unique 
and other, and I haven't seen that with a lot of other like uh, major corporate uh, partners that are out there. So, oh, glad to hear. Yeah, no, we're all, and we're always trying to add more to the startup accelerator programs and things like that. Um, all right, so now I guess Einar, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, with the big hype around digital health, what would you say are the main barriers or challenges you've faced, and what has helped you overcome that? You mean barriers for startups? Well, um, yeah, or getting access to data, I think, more on the digital health. In a little bit, we'll get into the startup challenges, but more on getting access to data. Any particular challenges that you found? I think uh, most big challenge is to learning curve of investors because uh, <laughs> yeah. they apply the same uh, tech thinking to the healthcare and they fail and they fail at last 10 years with the majority of startups. We still don't see any company who raise more than 1 billion in cash for hyper growth. It's just uh, uh, proven that nobody really get the product market fit yet because we just need to remember that the Uber market is a 50 billion dollar market and they raised 4 billion in cash to grow. So when we talk about healthcare, it's uh, industry 20 times bigger just in US and we never see any company who raised more than 1 billion in cash. It's, uh, and nobody could utilize this money even uh, because there are no channels, etc. So that's why the, the challenge, uh, and the reason why it's like that, it's because most of the startups, they uh, not act as a, uh, venture startups. They usually act as a very traditional business. So they hire a lot of sales reps and they start this long sales cycle. So instead of that, what we did in Priya, we understood that the healthcare providers, uh, to make them decision is much more costly than even pay for these services. So what we did, we launched the, our freemium model. So now any hospital, any provider in US could launch the health at home program in matter of the five hours. That's exactly ours, what we need to connect with the, uh, our HCC account and the Epic. Yep. instance so and then we do the after enrollment of the patients we even don't uh, use uh, uh, hospital staff we go to the uh, discharge model of the epic we find out eligible patients who recently was discharged and just ship them prior to the home we not involved any uh, like a hospital team and why it's important because the hospital over like crowded with the services, with the APIs, with the, it, but it's still hospital. It's not integrator company. So that's why uh, we as a startup, we face it that and we solve it by freemium model and how we make money, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I could answer that, but uh, that's I think a biggest challenge. Nobody in health tech really find this like a pure product market fit. Okay, that was excellent. I love the stats too as well. Alexander, did you encounter any unexpected challenges just getting access to the data? So actually I run three private clinics in Germany for yeah, orthopedy and uh, physiotherapy, osteopathy. And what we mentioned is that many patients are not really trusting the te modern technology, so we have to make a link between traditional healthcare and digital health because otherwise it just don't work. And we mentioned also that it's not only the trust in the technologies, it's also the emotional factor. Because if you have to prove somebody that you've done something that he prescribed to you, then the other, the patient, he will do it because he is internally motivated. He has this motivation from inside. If he don't have it, if, he, if the patient don't understand the why, doesn't care about the how. So this is where digital health is. Uh, we, as a startup, it was the same uh, to us. We thought everybody, the whole world is just waiting for our solution. <laughs> and it isn't like that. So when you face the real world, so patients, before they understand really the product, you have 
lost a lot of money and a lot of convincing time with them. And patients also give you the data with pleasure if they understand why. And this is where we really get the patient convinced with our B2B to C model. So we changed for that our business model because we use the trust from the providers that the patient already trusts in and don't implement any new names, any new products for the patient. The patient thing, he just make additional posture registration. He doesn't make any new software, any new app. And uh, here is our key, how we access the market for now, really successful in the last month. And uh, I recommend it to every startup out there and also to, uh, if for hospitals, it's much more easier to implement something when they can uh, make their own stamp on it and uh, patients don't, don't even uh, have to sign something new, anything. So it's much more easier to make implementation by trusted partners and not implement a new brand in digital health or something like this. So this is my advice also and also the biggest barrier out there. I love it. I love the creative approaches. Tarek, on your end, any uh, unexpected challenges just getting access to the data in the first place? Oh, yeah. yeah well, sharing your child's mental health data, that yeah. sort of <laughs> is, a, is a difficult issue to deal with. Um, in and of so, itself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, have to, we have to tread very carefully. And it is, a, just to double on what you're saying, it is a lot about trust and talking about the why and really engaging all the stakeholders in the process and making sure that that we're, we're really solving for a problem. The technology doesn't really mean anything if you're not uh, solving people's problems and working on relationships, right? So, so a lot of our focus has been in really engaging every stakeholder in the process. We're talking to teachers, school counselors, parents, uh, you know, I'm a provider myself. We talk to other healthcare systems. We're in a, a children's hospital accelerator right now, yep. uh, KidsX, and we're, inter we're interfacing with multiple children's hospital systems, as well as pay we were talking to payers today. Um, and trying to understand their pain points and then solve for them. And once we're able to listen and kind of direct our solution more to what they want, they open up. Uh, and I think it's easier to build that trust and, and make them want to, to open up to data. I mean, obviously the, the, the mental health crisis that, that children are experiencing and the kids were saying all the time, it's like, it's like the burning platform, right? Yep. But, but you have to understand like the little details of what's, what in the process is getting in the way. Why can't people share data? Why can't, you know, some people, people, there are people out there that know a kid has a problem and we're letting them linger. Like 40% of kids that are identified aren't getting treatments in this country when they, when people know they have a mental health condition wow. and we have shortages and, you know, so if we get to people early, we can identify, get proactive, pre practice preventative care and population health management. I think that'll make a big difference. And everyone is seeing, when, once we're laying out that vision, everyone is understanding uh, that we're engaging with and saying, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's share our data. Let's do it securely, right? And, you know, manage all these things, but, you know, let's, let's do it. And people are in. All right, terrific. And, and Daniel, they've covered a lot of ground. Again, uh, anything you would add in terms of challenges you, you found getting access to data? Well, I love this question. And yeah. maybe I'll start <laughs> this question by asking a question to the audience. Um, how many of you at some point have gotten a dental device of some sort, restoration, implant, retainer, aligner, night guard, <laughs> at some point. It, it's probably 95% of people, you know, 200 million tooth restorations in the US. You can think of all these products as dumb products. They're not doing anything. Okay, they're in the mouth, but what are they doing? Well, all of these products are exposed continually to one of the most valuable fluids in health diagnostics which is saliva, and they're not doing anything with it. Nothing, nil. Imagine if there was a magic switch that you could flip on, that all of a sudden you have hundreds of millions of patients turned on accessing continual health analytics based on their existing devices. Um, unlike a, you know, other sensor that you would need to get just for monitoring condition, a patient doesn't have to do anything else. They already have dental devices. They don't need to change their lifestyle in any way. They already have this. You can get a smart option um, with real-time health data. The biggest challenge has just been the hardware. Um, I mean, we need to make 
the, one of the smallest IoT wearables ever. It has to be a computer on the side of a tooth or integrated into a tooth or in a retainer or a liner. Smallest components, smallest batteries, smallest wireless charging, smallest antenna, smallest everything. And until this point, it hasn't been possible. But it's just at the point where it's possible, we're leading the way, and, and that's, that's been the trickiest part. Getting the hardware uh, right and miniaturized and comfortable enough that we can start streaming this valuable data set continually, and we're just at that point. I love it. So Daniel, I had a bungee cable take out my front tooth a couple wow. years ago. Should I do that again and get one of your uh, implants? You should Is that probably an upgrade I should be looking at, or? You should probably see a dentist. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Randy, can I uh, add one more case? Uh, it was real with the Wake Forest Hospital. Uh, we was in the call and uh, with the integration um, specialist from their side. And it was funny that I asked, like, how many integration you have in the queue? They said, we have uh, for the next six months, yep. we're fully booked. We have just two and a half developers who support integration. And I asked, okay, and how long we should wait our, uh, uh, the time when we will have the opportunity to integrate with us. He said like, maybe next eight, seven to eight months. And the problem is like, it's also in the uh, uh, provider side. As I said, they are still hospitals, they're not integrators. Yep. So, and when, when I said that we are based on inter-system platform, uh, and I also said to Paul Martin, our account, and he said, oh, I will bring our uh, account who managed Wake Forest to the call. And the next time when we was in the call, they both quickly exchanged few messages between each other. And our, the, the time of waiting from seven months was just seven days. Wow. So that's uh, the nature of relation of inter-system and when you based on that, because they already also work on that. Yes. So it's a, yeah. if the platform speak in one language, it's just a matter of few hours to really spend time and like just connect that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. We need to tell more of that sort of story. And um, all right, so Tarek, maybe starting with you now, you get to lead off a question here and, and getting away from the technology. And of course, this is being recorded, and who knows how many folks looking to follow in your footsteps will watch this. Uh, so what have you learned on your startup journey up to now, and what would you advise others who uh, have an idea and they want to get started? So at the highest level, non-technical, based on what you've learned, what would you tell somebody looking to get started? Yeah, so th this is probably, in, in the digital health world, this is probably my third or fourth kind of different type of venture whether internal at a company or dealing with an external startup. Uh, and I would say that probably the most important thing that I've always had to thought, think about is, is to be curious um, and to make sure that I'm asking lots of questions about what the problem is. I think one of the most dangerous things you can do as an innovator is have an idea and then, oh, then assume that you understand how it's gonna work and yeah. what everyone else is thinking <laughs> and how you're solving everyone else's problems and it never works that way. Um, and I've learned the hard way. Many <laughs> many a time, and you know, whether in healthcare or in digital health. Um, and and I, so I think asking lots of questions, and, and I touched on this earlier, but talking to your stakeholders and figuring out where the pain points are, and then, and then deliver and mold your idea uh, to fit, fit the area that, where it'll deliver the most value. Uh, and and I, think, I think that's an important step to start. It's like you go slow to go fast, and really spend a lot of time developing the idea up front. Uh, and then you can push out. And then the other component is it's a team sport yep. um, and try to engage and get collaboration and ask lots of questions. You know, get in, like our, our Maro is involved in like three, ex we've been in like in three or four accelerators and it's taught us valuable things along the way. Uh, and so just the more people you can talk to, the more you can help build, you know, build and understand and have a better journey and not, you know, run into to roadblocks. Oh, that's terrific advice. Daniel, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, um, I would probably say understand your adoption curve. You really need to spend most, your time is limited as a founder. You're over bandwidth capacity. You have a million things going on and everyone you know, can talk to you, but a lot of times you're just wasting your, your breath if you're not in the right room with the right people. Uh, you really need to find who's going to make things happen for you today. Uh, and somebody could be a great partner in a year or two from now, 
but if they have a slow bureaucratic process, if they're conservative, if they need lots more data, there's no chance that they're gonna be helpful in these early stages. So identify who's gonna help you now and accelerate, build momentum so that you can get to those later stage partners later. Terrific, terrific. Einer, I'm sure you have some words of wisdom. Uh, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Oh yeah, just non-technical at the highest level. Somebody today with an idea, hasn't ever uh, founded a startup before. Uh, What's the, uh, the first piece of advice you might offer? Oh, okay, okay. So uh, I've um, followed the concept of kill learning curve because uh, all startups uh, die because of the learning curve. They spend time to understand the technology, business model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I'm following the curiosity part that here. So what I di or did uh, when I start Priya, I just create the list of 100 uh, health tech companies and I message the under sea level people, head of general manager, et cetera, who is in hands-on. And uh, I asked the question about the industry and that's how I build the network of uh, first advisors, then team members. And uh, I believe that in healthcare, especially in healthcare, uh, we don't have a time and even chance to learn anything. Like uh, we need just to bring some person or team member who was there where you plan to go. That's the only way. Because otherwise you like you will die. You, you will don't have enough runway just to learn by yourself. So that's why if you look to our team executive now, uh, who is the biggest uh, health tech startup ever is uh, last three, five years is a tie to care. Two senior people now uh, uh, with the Priya. Yeah. So one who did all solutioning and pilots and second who did all sales. So because they did this in uh, 400 hospitals, like why I should learn from that? Uh, why I le should learn? My goal is as a CEO and founder to bring the people like that so experienced. And also the thing is like, if you can convince them, it means like you are out of the market yep. because it's much easier to convince investors the, than the people who really know the, you know, down to earth, who That's speak with the clients, etc. So kill learning curve. Okay, I love it, I love it. Alexander, anything you'd add to that? Oh, we got a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, we will have a startup pitch showcases. Uh, then I will explain the whole history of the Priya, how we did that, all these steps. It's just like... Terrific, well, yeah. don't miss that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Alexander, any high-level advice you would offer? My, the highest level advice I can give to everyone, learn to ask questions that even you get an honest answer from your mom. <laughs> and, this is, and this was the most, uh, thing, uh, the most important thing I learned in my startup journey, that many people lie to you when you ask the wrong questions, when you implement the answers in your questions, and when you talk to all the health innovators, but forget to talk with the patients. And this is one of the biggest things I was really uh, impressed by the insights that I get from the patients when I ask them before they tried our solution, so what the real problems are. So we really changed the way we communicate and it works, yeah, it works much better. So anyhow, it's one of the biggest challenges or was one of the biggest challenges, like Einar said, the learning curve. And I think one of the biggest learnings was spend the time with the right people in the right rooms. <laughs> and also to learn to ask the right questions to the right people. Yeah, that I can, that advice I can give to any startup out there. And don't spend too much time on fundraising. That kills you also. All right, all right, great advice. Ranger, uh, yes. Alexander just remind me the one, one of the biggest trap in the healthcare again. It's, uh, we have a world of words and world of actions. And this world is like totally different. Yep. <laughs> and if you apply uh, in any healthcare conference, everyone will talk about value-based care. Everyone will talk about patient-centric, etc. 
when you're in the closed room, okay, our target for the chief revenue officer or et cetera, et cetera, it will be only about day targets. So that's why it's a trap because we as a founders, we're very like passionate about the mission. We want to help people, but the real decisions is made by uh, money perspective and the KPI perspective. So our art and the art of uh, being a founder in health tech, it's a combine this. Uh, approaches, follow the money, but at the same time follow our passion and finally bring this innovation to the market. That's terrific. I know, I feel like a, a book is coming out someday in your future. You have a lot of great advice here. So uh, well, just, to, just to add maybe the, yeah. what Einar said, so when you found the right business model, that's the most important thing for your startup, I think. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That's, again, very good advice. Um, and so we have time for probably two more questions here. And Daniel, we're coming back around to you. Kick us off here. Uh, so of course, in the room, but also outside the doors, we have a broad audience of payers, providers, uh, med tech companies, uh, folks that really know uh, the healthcare space quite well. Uh, what types of uh, collaborations and partnerships are you looking for? We really want to connect with patients first. Patients are our guiding light to what's going to be acceptable in terms of form factors, what's going to improve their lives, what's going to improve their convenience, uh, and what's going to drive better outcomes. Um, so that's the core of everything, and we love nothing more than just talking to patients who have you know, experience with maybe other types of uh, sensors, other conditions that aren't being continually monitored, really assessing their needs. Uh, and you know, Patient groups are great, patient foundations are great, Layer on top of that, of course, is all the ecosystem that needs to you know, help us support patients. So, um, you know, systems like hospital systems, uh, strategic partners to distribute our, our products out, um, insurance providers later. But then, again, that's knowing your adoption curve. We're, we'll be there eventually, but right now, you know, we, we see patients as our main guiding light. All right, terrific. Einer, over to you. What types of collaborations are you interested in? We're interesting only on clients. <laughs> we don't have time for collaboration. Well, I'm kidding. But so anyone who have Medicare patients uh, and who want to launch health at home programs, that's our best partners where we could invest an enormous time and, and our energy and also money. And uh, I think uh, that's, that's all. <laughs> Right. Terrific. Alexander, any uh, particular partnerships or collaborations you're looking for? So we are looking for partnerships and collaborations with hospitals and insurances because we can reduce cost efficient uh, consultation time through the pre-screening we do. And the time to value with our product is really short. So we can save a lot of time and give the patients a better experience in the onboarding process. So that's our type of integrations or collaborations we are looking for. Right, terrific. And Tark? Yeah, um, so our next stage is because we have a marketplace, we've worked a lot with, uh, with families and with schools and we want to work on that focus more with healthcare providers right now and hospital systems. Um, I think our road, we're starting to blend er a little earlier than we were expecting, getting involved in the payer discussions. Uh, they're, they're vitally important and I think they, you know, for, unique to the mental health care space, uh, the way that, you know, carve out plans happen and, and Medicaid is allocated, it, it can really potentially bottleneck uh, mental health care access. So it's really, really vital in this particular space to engage with them and to make sure that we're, we're generating solutions that make sense for them. So, and we were just doing that uh, about an hour ago too, you know, with talking with some, some payers. So, uh, so that, that's probably the biggest new area of focus, but providers and payers are like probably where we're, we're dialed in at the moment. All right, terrific. Let me see. Um, with a few minutes to go, I do have another question, but I want to give the audience a chance uh, to ask these brilliant minds, these creative minds, if there's any questions out there. And all right, we'll go to Chip first. You got a microphone coming your way, Chip. I'm curious what each of you found to be the most frustrating part of the startup process. 
Good question. Maybe uh, Alexander, we'll start with you. What was the most frustrating part of your journey so far? So the most frustrating part of the journey was that we everything takes longer than you expect, especially in the beginning. And the curve of your euphoria and meets the curve of reality really fast. And then you first have the, and of, out of months, it become a year or a year and a half. But if you survive that time, if you get through this frustrational time, you get a lot of uh, benefits from the value you're delivering outside. But this was, in my mind, the most frustrating time when nobody understands the solution and you have to explain it really hard. <laughs> Gotcha. Tarek, you've been down this road a few times. Anything uh, yeah. particularly frustrating? I mean, I, th I think those, those were, I would add to those frustrations, but um, I think for our space, particularly uh, marketplace complexity uh, is a problem. Understanding the payer market is very difficult in the space. Uh, and then dealing with regulatory uh, issues. Uh, so those are probably yeah. two of the biggest yeah. challenges. Right, uh, I hear you. <laughs> Daniel? I'd say, well, it's a great question. I'd say how founder-centric or founder-heavy a successful startup has to be in the sense that I'm an engineer by background. I'm a biomedical engineer. So when I see something that makes sense, it's like this has to be the way it's done. Um, and early on when I wasn't so experienced, I was like, well, why aren't, why aren't we winning these pitches? Why aren't people getting it? And it had nothing to do with the products or service. It was just all the founder. It was all who can understand the lingo, who can understand how these investors communicate these soft skills, uh, you know, and they might see a young founder and dock that, or they might see some sort of uh, intangible that, you know, or being nervous or whatever. So that was really frustrating. But on the flip side, I was mostly frustrated with myself for not being, you know, apt in those skills. And it's something that you learn. And it, you know, at the end of the day, it's all people talking to people. All right. I don't know anything you'd add to that. Yeah. Uh, we did four pivots during the last 10 months. And uh, I changed core team members almost three times. And uh, starting every time from the scratch, almost from the scratch. And, uh, uh, but the most difficult, I think, frustrating was uh, uh, how to integrate your vision to the real world uh, and find the, this money process. Yeah. Because it's look like from legal perspective and from compliance perspective, et cetera, the money is floating is, should be uh, like uh, traceable, easily uh, understandable, but it's not. And uh, to crack the understanding of the money, it's important for the business model. Otherwise, even if you have a good product, and, uh, but you can't find the market for that scalable market again, that's uh, the biggest problem. So that's, I think, most frustrating to understand how really money is going in this industry and find out how we could uh, add the value for the same amount of money or even like uh, save a lot of money for some uh, part of the stakeholders. All right, well, terrific. And with that, we're right on time here. Again, I'd like to thank uh, these very creative folks for joining me up here. And uh, maybe we'll give them a round of applause. And uh, Einar, if you want to mention that session one more time, it sounds like a good one. Yeah, uh, so it's a, uh, call it startup something showcase. <laughs> one second, I will find out exactly. That's not the official name. Startup yeah. showcase lightning pitches, yeah. It started in 15 minutes uh, and just follow us because we also will look where is it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mar will be pitching there too. So we'll so <laughs> see what yeah. it's good. Come well, take a look at Alexander, Einar, and Daniel, thank, thank you, you all very much. Uh, thank this you. was a great thank session. You. Thank you.